Can can everyone hear me? Is yours on? It's not on. You gotta press the switch. There's a switch. Hello. Hello, audience. Um, I am your humble moderator. Uh, my name He's is Ryan. He's not that humble. No. I'm your in impressively humble moderator, Ryan Alexander Tanner. I'm here to interview. I mess up the word interview. That's a bad start. Yeah. Interview. They've, you've already lost them. Kurt Busiek. Busiek. Busiek? Yes. I've been saying that wrong for 15 years. I know. So that's, was that I worse? I was there when you first said it. <laughs> is that worse? I than, was crushed. Is that worse than saying interview wrong? Probably not. I'm here to interview Kurt Busiek. Well, I, I am, I am noticing that your problem is with the, the IE diphthong. Yeah. So. Well, it's funny because I was telling people I was going to interview you and uh, asking sort of on the internet, what should I ask him? And someone was said, ask him how to, uh, how to pronounce his last name. And I was oh like, oh, I know. Covered. Just, the so. BU is, is like in Busema, and the SIE is in like in Sienkiewicz. Um No one has trouble pronouncing Sienkiewicz <laughs> ever. <laughs> that one's an easy one. I was, I was very embarrassed when I found out that uh, uh, John Busema's name is pronounced Busema because for years I'd been seeing him in the comics and I'd been calling him John Buskema. Buskema. And yeah. when I thought found out it was Busema, it was like, oh, it's pronounced like my name. <laughs> 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 and I didn't even think of that. Flew moron, right past. Moron yeah. person. So um, on to the uh, topics. Of topics. topics. <laughs> we have topics. So we're going to talk for a bit, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So store your inquiries for Kurt Busiek, and uh, you'll have plenty of time to ask him at the end. So you have a pretty wide range of work to discuss, um, but I think whenever anyone gets you on a panel or comes to see you, there's always probably one central thing they want to ask about. So I thought we would start with talking about your work on the adventures of Jello Man and Wobbly in 1991. That was uh, that was a, a a a diphthong in my career. Yes. Yeah. Would you say it's it's always hard to um, work pat? You know, you build up a level of expectation from a project like that. That was you know 15 years ago. It's hard to or 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's would you say it's haunted your career? I never got to write the rest of the stories. What happened? There was supposed to be more issues. I mean, I I was I was. Uh, I had invented a whole superhero team for Jello Man, the, yeah. the snack pack, <laughs> um, and and there was there was Pudding Pop. He was the old crusty guy, and uh, uh, Jello Jiggler was the sexy oh you know yeah. gal character. And disgusting. And uh, there was going to be a story where where one of the villains tried to travel back in time to prevent the origin of Jello, mm. um, and I never got to write it. Those hooves were never going to be ground up. But the the best part. Best part about writing uh, the the adventures of Jello Man and Wobbly um, was uh, we had this little character bible about Jello Man, explaining that Jello Man was 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 really cool, and they explained that Jello Man was really cool by saying he's like a a combination of Michael J. Fox, Bill Murray, and Jack Nicholson. <laughs> And I was looking at that and going, he's a cartoon adventure character made out of Jello. <laughs> There's no Jack Nicholson in this character <laughs> at all. <laughs> and 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 but, you know, and and it was explained to me that yeah, this is marketing speak. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, but I couldn't resist that in my story in which uh, Jello Man is is along with a group of school children who have made a field trip to the, to the Natural History Museum, whereupon all of their uh, Jell-O pudding snacks have been stolen um, by, by a, uh, uh, a, a villainous dinosaur named the Snackosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> and Jell-O Man sorry, and we have to stop the film. <laughs> 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 okay, no. Jell-O Man and Wobbly have to save the day and, and uh, and and the Snackosaurus is trying to sneak away with all but one of the of the, the pudding snacks, and uh, 
and, and Jello Man says, here, here, you missed one, and he tosses it to him. And, and the Snackosaurus is saying, oh, no, it's too many. How Snackosaurus hold extra one? And Jello Man says, why don't you hold it between your knees? And, <laughs> and I knew that they were going to cut that. But they didn't. <laughs> they had no idea. It, it's in the comic. And, and you know, four-year-olds and five-year-olds across America said, uh, okay, he's uh, sarcastic and smart-alecky, and any of their parents who read it went, ah! <laughs> then that's, that's the joy of writing comics. All right, so I'd like to apologize to the audience for amusing Look myself. Look at these smiles. <laughs> with that aside. These are, this is a happy audience. I, I just had to ask something about Jello Man and Wobbly. So these are now onto the real questions. Um, no, so one thing that I think really um, is very apparent in your work is like a real true love of comics and knowledge of the characters and those worlds. Um, and I'm curious, like what was the, what, for you the sort of formative moment that made you know that writing comics is what you wanted to do? Uh, well, I'll describe two moments. All right. Because I didn't read comics when I was a kid, you know, mm. the age most people are. When That's they, very surprising. I read some comics, but I didn't read American, uh, you know, newsstand comic books. Um, my parents met in uh, 1953 when Seduction of the Innocent was published. Mm -hmm. um, and while they were in college and falling in love and getting married and all, it was the whole uh, anti-comics, comics cause juvenile delinquency, blah, blah, blah stuff. Uh, going on in the U.S., so one they they had uh, they had three rules for their kids: um, no candy unless they give it to us, no television unless they approve of it, and no comic books. Hmm. Um, and to this day, I don't eat that much candy, I don't watch that much television, and two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but I started reading comics as a you know as I was a. a a reader, you know. I went to the library. I read through everything I could find in the children's library. I started reading in the in the uh, mythology and and folklore section of the adult library. I would read anything I could find, and the stuff that I liked best was any book where the author had written a whole bunch of books. That might be a series, mm -hmm. and if it was a series, I could read a book, and if I liked it, I could find out what happened next. So those were my favorites. Enid Blyton novels and Oz books and, and uh, uh, Lloyd Alexander and, and, and Danny Dunn science fiction novels, anything where if I liked it, I could see what happened next. And every now and then I would, I would buy a comic book at the drugstore and read it while I was walking home. Um, and then I would store it under a flat rock in the neighbor's backyard where it would turn back into wood pulp. Um, because my parents, you know, they didn't, they didn't like comics. The comics I did read, I'm, I'm sort of all over the map here, but uh, the comics I did read, they had uh, uh, collections of Doonesbury and Beetle Bailey and Pogo, um, and they had uh, European comics like Asterix and Tintin, which they'd bought in multiple languages on the idea that we'd be interested because they were comics. We gotta talk about Jello Man more. We're losing the audience. Oh, no. Um, that feedback. Yeah. But uh, uh, they, their theory was we'd be interested because they were comics and maybe that would get us interested in learning foreign languages. And it worked on, on my sister Amy who was a language major uh, in, in uh, uh, college and a language specialist in the army and now she teaches English as a second language to, to immigrants in Wisconsin. Um, me, I just like the comics, so I learned how to say these Romans are crazy in pretty much every modern European language. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I would occasionally read a, a superhero comic, um, and when I got Daredevil 120, it was part one of a four-part story where Daredevil fought Hydra, and there were b a bunch of footnotes explaining that here uh, Daredevil and the Black Widow are going to a, a New Year's Eve party at Foggy Nelson's. And, and, and the Black Widow gets all upset because, because Foggy Nelson, that is the man who put me on trial for the crime of being a Russian. Actually, for murder, but uh, <laughs> it's comics, it's the same thing. And there was a little footnote saying that that was Daredevil 83. Mm -hmm. And so that told me stuff that happened years ago was still important. Yeah. And the comic was continued, but also all of the new section chiefs of Hydra were existing villains from other 
stories mm. that uh, uh, here was man killer who showed up in, in uh, uh, Marvel team up and here was a character who showed up in strange tales and here was a character who showed up in Iron Man and here was there were footnotes yeah. and I was uh, so it was telling me that not only is what happened years ago in this series still important but what happened in other comic books was important so it was a it was a series that not only spread out in time but also side to side into yeah. other series um, and the letters page, instead of having a letters page that month, they had a history of Hydra oh, to man. tell me all these other ways that the, the history of all this stuff mattered. And it was continued in the next issue, you yeah. know? So, so it was like continuity crack. <laughs> it just <laughs> said, Kurt, you love this sort of thing in books, and hear even more of it. In this one 17-page story, you've gotten references to eight other comic books. You've got a history that mentions, you know, ten more. Um, and in order to get the next chapter, you've got to find a place that will be selling the next issue. Mm -hmm. By the time the next issue came out, I'd found a comic book store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I bought comics there uh, until I went off to college where I found another one and blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's how I started reading comics. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of years after that, there was a letter column in, I think it was X-Men 98, uh, and uh, Chris Claremont told a story about how his grandfather used to ask him, you know, so Chris, you write the funny books, but what do you do for a living? <laughs> and I'm not sure why Chris, who was born in England, why his, his grandfather <laughs> sounds like an elderly New York Jew, but uh, <laughs> I'd never met Chris when I read the letters page, so, so, uh, so, you know, that's my experience of Chris's grandfather. But that was the point where I read that and went, oh, this is a job. Mm. This is what he does for a job. I had always wanted to be a writer, and I'd always found it intimidating, mm. the idea that, you know, if you write a novel, it's going to take you like a year to write a novel. And then you're going to be done with it, and it's going to suck because you've never done it before. You know, first time you write a novel, it's going to stink. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to write another one, and that's going to be another year, and that's just so much work. <laughs> and it's just so, how would you put in all that work for something that you then have to just throw away? Comic books, comic books were 17 pages long back then. And I thought, well, I could write something that's 17 pages long. And if it sucked, well, of course it'll suck. But then I could write another one because it was only 17 pages. <laughs> and, and, and so I talked my friend Scott McLeod into working on a comic book with me. Uh, he had wanted to go to MIT and be some sort of scientist. Um, but uh, he was interested in art and drawing things. And so uh, uh, I, he, had, he designed maps of spaceships and things. Mm. I thought, well, you can draw stuff. Maybe you can draw a comic book, and we'll come up with a 17-page a, a story, and we'll do it as a comic book and have fun doing it, and I'll have had some practice. By the time we were done with that 17-page comic book, it was 60 pages long. We'd worked on it for three years, and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no problem moving right on to do another one because I loved it. And, and, uh, and we worked on comics in college, and by the time we graduated from college, he had a job in the DC uh, production department, and uh, I had sold my first script to Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. Actually, to DC Comics. I sold <coughs> my first script to Marvel just after I, uh, uh, the graduation ceremony. Um, but we had a lot of fun making comics, figuring it out, practicing, and, and we kind of taught ourselves how to make it. What was the script you sold to DC? Um, uh, I had uh, I had written here. I'm backtracking and telling this whole other story, but uh, you know I think we locked the doors so you can't mm. get out. <laughs> uh, Pretty sure they came to hear you tell stories. So. Um, uh, I did when when I was in college. I took a course in magazine publishing because I figured it might be useful to me in my chosen career of writing comics to know something about the business. And we had to interview um, the publisher of a national magazine. And I convinced them to let me interview the editor-in-chief of DC Comics mm -hmm. on the grounds that the ad circulation across the entire line of DC Comics made it analogous to a national magazine. Um, uh, and uh, the editor-in-chief would be uh, as interesting, uh, you know, 
they didn't really care. They just wanted me to learn something about the business and talk to somebody who was in the business. But I, I arranged to go to New York and to interview Dick Giordano, who was then the editor-in-chief at DC. And I interviewed him for the paper. And at the end of the paper, I told him that you know I wanted to be a comic book writer if I grew up. And he invited me to send him in some, some sample scripts. So I went back to school, and I wrote four sample scripts. I wrote a 25-page a Flash script, and I wrote a 12-page Supergirl story, and an 8-page Superman the In-Between Years backup, and a Brave and the Bold script with Batman and Green Lantern, and I sent them all off to Dick. And Dick was a very busy guy, and he didn't have time to read them. But after I pestered his secretary for a while, he apparently looked at him enough to go, okay, these aren't written in crayon. Um, the sentences all seem to be complete sentences. So he handed them out to the editors of the books they were written for. Um, the guy who was editing Brave and the Bold never read my Brave and the Bold script. Um, but you know he bought stuff from me later, so I forgive him. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, Julie Schwartz was the editor of the Superman books, and he passed on my scripts to his assistant, E. Nelson Bridwell. Uh, and Nelson told me that both of my scripts were perfectly publishable but. And the but was that I'd written a, a, a script for Superman the In-Between Years um, as a backup series that had just been canceled, so they didn't need any scripts mm -hmm. for that. And I'd written a, a uh, Supergirl story for, for Superman Family that was all about how Supergirl, you know, it was set in the time that Supergirl was a soap opera actress. Um, but Superman Family had just been canceled and the Supergirl was being relaunched in her own series in which she was going to be a college student in Chicago. Mm. So they had no use for a script about her being a soap opera actress. But because Nelson thought the scripts were good, Julie Schwartz invited me to pitch him some Superman stories, some Superboy stories. So I pitched him like 18 different Superboy ideas and he didn't like any of them. Um, so he told me, go to lunch. And when I came back from lunch, he had typed up a plot, a loose plot, for a Superboy story. And he said, write up like the first six, seven pages of this and bring it back next week. So I did that, and he said, this is terrible. <laughs> here's what you're doing wrong here, here's what you're doing wrong here, here's what you're doing wrong here, and, 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 and you're cramming way too much story in per page. And I said, well, you said I had 15 pages. And he said, uh, I, I uh, you know, well, if you needed two parts, you should have told me you needed two parts. And I'm like, I've never sold a comic book script in my life. You're Julie Schwartz, <laughs> you know, creator, editor of, of, of the modern DC universe. How, you know, who am I to tell you your plot is too long? <laughs> um, so I never sold anything to Julie. Um, but the Flash script I wrote, had been given to Ernie Cologne, who was then uh, the editor on Flash, and he said, your script's not bad, um, uh, but you know, Carrie Bates has been writing the Flash for 17 years. He's not gonna stop anytime soon. I don't need any fill-ins, um, but I edit Green Lantern, and we have a backup series in Green Lantern called Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, where we're telling seven-page stories about other members of the Green Lantern Corps. Come up with some ideas for that. So. I went off and I came up with 16 different Tales of the Green Lantern Corps ideas, um, and he liked one of them. <laughs> so I wrote that up, uh, brought it in the next week, and he liked that, and that was my first, uh, the first story I ever <laughs> sold. Um, uh, while I was working on another Green Lantern Corps story for him, uh, I had been uh, going to the Marvel press conferences at that time their idea of a press conference was uh, stringers from the various fan press magazines, of which there were about four, <laughs> um, would show up at the office once a week and they'd say things like, oh, John Byrne is going to draw the cover of this and, and, and there's going to be a fill-in issue of, of that and, you know, just little news tidbits that we could then send off to the main magazine and have published in the, in the news section. Um, and every time there was a press conference, they told us, you know, that the next issue of Power Man Iron Fist was not going to be Bob Layton's first issue as a writer. It was going to be a one-issue story by Denny O'Neill, the book's editor. And I went, Bob's not turning in his work. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been something else, you know. It might have been that the artist was, uh, uh, was slow, except the artist was drawing all the fill-ins. 
Um, so, so I, you know, it seemed like the editor of Power Man Iron Fist was having to write a new story every month because his new regular writer wasn't getting the job done. And I thought, well, maybe he could use a filling. Mm -hmm. So I wrote up a one-page, page-and-a-half description of a Power Man and Iron Fist story, and I sent it to Denny O'Neill uh, with a note saying, uh, I'm already writing professionally for DC. I didn't mention for only seven pages so far. <laughs> um, but Denny liked the story. He called me up. He asked me to flesh it out into a script. I, I, uh, I did so. He bought it. Um, I pitched him another one, he bought it. I pitched him a two-parter, he bought that. And while I was working on that, I was still going to these press conferences. And, uh, uh, and, and at one of them they said, oh, and there's a new regular writer on Power Man and Iron Fist. And I thought, oh, well, that was fun while it lasted. And, uh, and uh, then they mispronounced my name. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, Denny, uh, Denny never did tell me I was the regular writer on the book. Um, I, I learned it from covering the press conference, <laughs> but that was that was that was how I got my first uh, first regular book, which is more than the question you asked. Yeah. But that how just old were you when all that happened? Uh, I was uh, I was 21. Wow. Um, it was 1982. I turned 22 in September, but all of this happened in like May June. So this was all in New York then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And had you went to college out there? I went to college in Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Boston area. Went to college in Syracuse. After, after we graduated, Scott had the job offer from D.C. Mm -hmm. um, so we moved down to New York and we found an apartment. Um, and and uh, we were living in Manhattan and he was going to work at D.C. every day and I was pitching freelance stuff. Um, so yeah. What was your degree in? Uh, I have a, a, a bachelor's in English literature with a concentration in Shakespeare. All right. Because when you take all the courses you can think of that might be possibly helpful in writing comic books, what you end up with is a bachelor's in English lit with a concentration in Shakespeare. Sounds good, <laughs> yeah. Those Shakespearean narratives. I have never had to show anybody my diploma. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody, nobody has ever cared. Uh, in the comic book industry that I am a college graduate. Whenever I get gigs, they always go, you have a BFA, right? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I always like, too, these people's stories of how they got on. like, oh, and I just happen to know Scott McCloud, by the way. Like, <laughs> we just happen to be good friends. That's yeah, well, I, 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 I take full credit or responsibility for Scott because <laughs> he, he didn't even read comics. He thought mm. comics were for kids. He'd never read comic books. Mm. But... He's not here to defend himself about that. Oh, he would agree with this. <laughs> um, he, he uh, um, uh, we met in the first day of junior high school, mm -hmm. and we became friends, uh, and he had a pool table. So mm -hmm. I would go over to his house and, and argue him into playing pool with me, which I always lost. And he was interested in chess, so he'd get me to play chess with him, which I usually won until he got scary good at it. <laughs> um, but I was getting more and more interested in comics, and I needed somebody to talk to about comics. So I loaned him nearly a complete run of the original X-Men, and I said, read these. And he didn't want to, um, but I pestered him until he read them, and he, he liked them a lot. And that got us both started talking about and figuring out comics. But he, he wouldn't have been exposed to comics at all if I didn't need somebody to talk to, and he happened to be there. So. You were like, I want you to understand these comics. <laughs> um, so moving right along, um, <clears throat> one thing like in a lot of your sort of larger works, like things like Marvels and Astro City, that I think sort of encapsulate those works are this idea of sort of like a regular person experiencing life among the superheroes, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a layman's perspective. And um, <clears throat> I've always thought that was interesting because I always sort of felt like that mirrored your perspective. Like, do you feel like that's you almost describing your own experience as a comics reader? That's an interesting, you know, I haven't thought about that before. <laughs> um, I always thought it was, uh, it was simply because I, I, you know, my particular nature is such that I didn't really imagine myself as the hero. Mm -hmm. When I would be walking to school in the morning, I wouldn't think, oh, if I was Spider-Man, I could just bounce over that that 
telephone pole, I'd think, oh, if Spider-Man bounced over that telephone yeah. pole, it would be really cool to watch. Yeah. You know, and what would it be like if Iron Man came roaring up Mass Ave <coughs> and, you know, it would shake the windows and things like that. And I, I, I kept imagining what it would be like to see these characters rather than what it would be like to be these characters. And I'd, 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 I would wonder things like, you know, my sister is a big fan of such and such of a TV actor who's got a poster out of him with no shirt on and his, his, his the top button of his jeans undone looking <laughs> sultry at the camera. What do teenage girls in the Marvel Universe have on their walls? Do they yeah. have pictures of the Human Torch? You yeah. know, posters? <laughs> I figured Captain America wouldn't do it. Yeah. Spider-Man, nobody would trust him enough. You yeah. know, who would, who would do this? And it would just be like, yeah, it would be Johnny Storm. Yeah, <laughs> he'd, he'd be the one. Um, uh, and I, you know, I'd ask myself questions like that, and and so I was I was I was interested in the questions of what would it be like to be in that world and see this kind of stuff going on around you, and then I became a fan of the novels of Neville Shute. Um, he wrote A Town Like Alice. He wrote On the Beach, um, uh, uh, but he he wrote a bunch of other books too, uh, many of which are about very, very ordinary people who get caught up in very, very big events. Um, and so when I was writing Marvels, I was kind of consciously influenced by, by Neville Shute. Hmm. But that also fed into uh, just my own take on uh, I'm interested in this world. I'm interested in what goes on in this world when they're not fighting Galactus. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I always thought it was really funny there were a couple of times that Marv Wolfman started an issue with three pages of the superhero fighting basically a nobody throwaway yeah. villain, saying, ever wonder what happens between issues, Effendi? Well, and I thought, in between issues, they fight less interesting guys? <laughs> and I, I thought it, in between issues was when they, you know, when they, when they paid the rent, when, yeah. they, when, they, when, when he tried cases, the Daredevil would try cases that he'd win, when Spider-Man would take <laughs> photos of other things, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and pass his classes and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So that had me thinking, you know, what is it like? When I first pitched the idea that, that all of this stuff came from, I pitched a, a series called Marvel Superheroes. And the idea was there was a, 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 a deli named Superheroes in the Baxter Building. On the first floor of the Baxter Building, there was a guy who sold coffee and sandwiches and, and, and you know, bialis and bagels and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, it was his. He was called Superheroes for the sandwiches. Oh. Um, and uh, every issue, oh. somebody would stop in and get their breakfast or their lunch or whatever, and go out into the Marvel universe. And they'd be late for work because the Hulk was having a fight with a thing on the George Washington Bridge, yeah. or or you know, Spider Man would have a fight with somebody in their in their office building, and we'd get to see what uh, you know what life was like for the other guys. And. Uh, you know, I pitched it to somebody and he laughed at me. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't what anybody wants to see. And I got to write a couple of different stories that were that sort of idea. I wrote an Iron Man story, an eight page story um, that appeared in, ironically, uh, a, uh, a, a, an anthology called Marvel Superheroes. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, it was a story about a guy who worked in the Stark Industries motor pool, and every month he'd put in an application for transfer. He wanted to be Iron Man, mm -hmm. and uh, they would explain to him, "No, look, we've got an Iron Man." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, but you know, he's on duty all the time, so you must have at least three guys for you know three shifts, and then you have uh, uh, you know at least one other guy to cover weekends." And and uh, and they said, "No, no, no." And he said, "Well, you got to have a trainee program because you know." <laughs> There was that. There was that time that that Iron Man died, and uh, and you had a new Iron Man up and going, and like right, he was really good. So <laughs> he must have been, you know. And and, and uh, uh, I did another story that showed up in the back of the Avengers Annual about a kid in Iowa who idolized the Avengers, um, and he was all excited about the Avengers the day they came to town to battle the Sons of the Serpent, and then he discovered that the leader of the Sons of the Serpent was his older brother. And you know what was this completely typical battle between the Avengers and the Sons Son of the Serpent like from the point of view of somebody who's in that position? Mm -hmm. And after that, I got to do Marvels, and uh, 
So when I decided I wanted to do Astro City, um, you know, I'd had a little bit of experience writing this kind of story, and I had also, um, uh, I, I think I'd sort of proved that there were people who were interested in, you know, what is it like for the other guys? What is it like for, you know, that kind of story is a story uh, that there's an audience for. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Uh, so, I mean, there's always sort of the concept of the one and the other, like, I can see myself as Spider-Man, or, or there's always the idea that the Marvel superheroes are, are the one, they're you, and then DC superheroes are more the other. Like, you can never see yourself as being Wonder Woman or Batman, because they're beyond you, but you can sort of see yourself as, I mean, maybe you can, but <laughs> but you can sort of see yourself as, you know, being Peter Parker and having this thing thrust onto you. But So what you're sort of describing is seeing the characters more as the other, looking at them rather than through them. But you have written a lot of, uh, like, Avengers comics. So is that a particular challenge for you, like, writing, sort of inca being Captain America as you're writing it, since you see, you've seen him more from the outside? I, I no, um, because, you know, when you figure out how to write stories, you've got to, um, I mean, that was an adjustment to make. When I first started writing comics, I wrote from a very sort of plot point of view. Mm -hmm. There was characterization and all. But but I was, I mean, I wrote pretty mechanical stories that were, I think of them as structured like the Batman TV show. A villain shows up, the hero fight the villain, the villain gets the best of them, the villain escapes. The heroes go, oh man, we gotta figure out how to beat that villain. Then they fight him again and they figure out how to beat him and they take him to jail. <laughs> That's, on, that's me, the right, plot I'm of every, every two-part <laughs> Batman TV series. <laughs> um, and, and I wrote a lot of, you know, my early Power Man and Iron Fists are all, uh, you know, here's a villain. He's doing bad things. He's doing bad <laughs> things for this reason, but he's doing <laughs> bad things. He comes in conflict with Power Man and Iron Fist, and he beats them. And they come back, and they figure out the, the plot solution to how to beat him. Um, and once I, I figured out how to write from the point of view, you know, of character, from character outward rather than from plot inward, um, I told a lot fewer stories like that. Hmm. Uh, but, um, uh, but it was, you know, it was just a matter of practice, really. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, I mean, every time you sort of take on this written persona, you have to really think about that, like what makes Captain America tick or whatever, right? Like yeah, but... but is about Captain America mm -hmm. written from the point of view of, you know, Captain America is the focus character, character Captain America is the lead, Captain America has lots of sad thought balloons of, oh, if only I could spend some time with Sharon, but now I've got a hydra and a snoot. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that, that, that first off it was easy to mm -hmm. the process of shifting my perspective from outside to inside uh, Mm -hmm. So um, we had a nice segue earlier to Astro City, but then I asked you some more stuff, so let's go back to that one. Yeah. I know, I messed <laughs> it up. I blew it. Oh, uh, we got one. We got one. That's I'm doing all right. You're you know? not bad. I'm, uh, I'm, fight not. I'm fighting a cold, you know. I had a long, I had a long week. Do you want to do that? We we're going to do that at the end, but we can do it now. Then we'll talk about Astro City. So, you want to get some? Yep. Yeah.
90% of television is crap. 90% of movies are no damn good. If you try to make good things, 10% of the time you'll get good things. <laughs> so uh, it's not that the, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the people, you know, in the highest offices at Disney don't really care very much whether Marvel Comics are good or not um, because they've delegated that responsibility. But Joe Quesada, Axel Alonso, Tom Brevoort, these guys care. Um, uh, you know, Tom is very open about the fact that he doesn't have to, you know, the book does not have to be a book that he would personally like. In fact, he's probably doing his job wrong if all the books he's putting out are books that he would personally like. Because he needs to be putting out books that the audience out there will like. And the audience out there isn't always going to agree with him. But he needs to be putting out books that are well-crafted professional, emotionally involving stories that will, um, uh, that will connect with the readership. And the thing is, for you, 10% of it is good and the rest of it is bleh. For him, same thing, but you don't agree which 10%. Mm. I mean, you might, from the look of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, there will, pe there will be people out there who are passionately devoted to stuff that you think is crap. I mean, I don't understand how anybody can read the Twilight novels. <laughs> I don't know how people can read Dan Brown. But they do, and they like it. And they're probably, you know, there are people out there who are going, you're really excited because, you know, three days from now there's a new Stephen King novel out and he just writes crap. And I'm like, no, I can't wait, I gotta see it. Um, uh, so, so uh, you know, everybody's 90% is, uh, is a slightly different 90%. But the answer is yes, they do care. Um, they may be operating from different rules about what constitutes a good and exciting involving story than you do, than I do, than he does. Um, uh, oddly, his. They're right down the line with us. <laughs> They're just failing you, sir. Um, but no, everybody, everybody, you go online and you, you look about how the other things do or the, the, the TV scoop that we have or whatever that doesn't care about anything but blah, 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 blah. All of them care about anything but crap. They just have different tastes and interests and views on how to let them know. Yes, many. Um, well, for years I wanted to write Commandy, and every mm -hmm. time I would ask DC, can I do a Commandy series, they'd say, we're waiting for Grant Morrison. <laughs> Grant, <laughs> Grant has expressed an interest in Commandy, and, and we're waiting for him. And at one, one point, they told me that, and I said, Grant's exclusive to Marvel. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but that's going to end, and he's interested in Commandy, and we're kind of holding it for him. And after a while, I just thought, you know, what I like about Commandy is this, 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 and this. I could build a new series around those things, and I wouldn't need a teenage blonde kid with no shirt, and I wouldn't need the, the empire of, of uh, tigers and lions, and I wouldn't need, you know, I could do my own animal people in the future story that was all about magic rather than science, and that was as much Jack Vance as it was Jack Kirby, and I'm working on that now. So, so the fact that, uh, uh, that DC didn't let me do the book, you know, and I would have done, you know, eight, nine issues of Commandy, and then it would have been canceled for poor sales. Um, uh, now I, I, I have my own creator-owned book that I'm, that I'm working on, and when it comes out, hopefully it'll last, you know, 40, 50 issues, and I'll come to a conclusion, and it'll be everything I want it to be, and, you know, thanks, DC, for not letting me do that. <laughs> um, I know I've, I have never really been able to write the Legion. Um, I, I'd love to write the Legion. Um, I, uh, I've written the Fantastic Four in guest appearances here and there. 
but I never had a chance to write an ongoing Fantastic Four series. Uh, Hal Jordan is Green Lantern. That would have been fun. I've written him in Justice League, written him uh, in, in one shots, but never got to chart the destiny of, of that character. There's lots of characters out there. Um, you know, I would, I would uh, if I could easily get the license to do comic books based on an old television series called Alias Smith and Jones, well, I'd love to do that. <laughs> um, uh, I, can, I can quote the opening, uh, uh, you know, the opening from the TV series verbatim, even after all these years. Um, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I'd also like to do my own characters, and, and, and as time goes on, I more and more want to do my own stuff, and less and less want to do stuff that, uh, uh, that other people own. For instance, if I want to do a Thor story, do I want to do a Thor story that I will sell to Marvel and let them tell me what I can and can't do, or do I want to do a story about the mythological Thor that I can own myself because he's in the public domain? Um, and if somebody makes a movie about him, they'll pay me. <laughs> um, so, so uh, yeah, there's trade-offs. No, no. I, I, for one thing, I've been sick for the past few years, and I don't, I don't really have the time. For another, Jeff really transformed that world. Um, and if I went and did the kind of thing I want to do in Green Lantern, people would be going, this isn't like what Jeff is doing. You know, they need somebody to follow Jeff who will be going kind of in a similar direction. And when four or five writers down the road, when people are tired of that, um, that's when you do a, a bold new direction. But it probably wouldn't be me because, like I said, I want to do you know, if, if, if I really wanted to write Hal Jordan, I'd make up a character who's like Hal Jordan, put him in a different situation, uh, make him even a different genre, you know, make him an international spy or military troubleshooter or something instead of a superhero at all, and, and have the fun that I could have out of writing a character like that um, without doing it under somebody else's rules. Um, yeah, then we can go back to you. By the way, it's nice of you to call on him when he thought you were doing a terrible I know, job. This That's guy. He's, he's let's, not up to my esteem. let's see how well you do now with the yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah now you know. Go. You're on the hot, Steve. <laughs> uh, well, first, uh, you know, I've just been a fan. I've, I followed some of your work, Astro City, literally for decades. And, um, you know, you and Alex Ross, and I guess, you know, you with Marvel and uh, sort of Mark Wade with DC, you guys have created a very archetypical image of, you know, sort of a superhero team and sort of superhero mythology. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of curious about your feeling on the sort of the, the current cinematic take on it and, you know, the way it's sort of reflected and not necessarily reflected, you know, from the stuff that you guys have done. Well, I don't ever expect people to do, you know, the same sort of thing that I would do. Um, and, and my view of the Marvel Universe, at least while I was working there, was very much built on this is what Stan did, this is what Roy did, this is what Steve Englehart and Archie Goodwin and guys like that did. And I want to build on those structures. And what the movie guys have done is they said this is the, you know, this is the most popular attitude. Exactly, yeah. And so we're going to build a Tony Stark who's built around uh, you know, it, clearly the root of that character is the the Michelani Layton Iron Man. Um, uh, but uh, you know, the the directors and writers went back to the to the Stan Lee, Don Heck, Gene Colan. You know, we've got Pepper Potts, we've got Happy Hogan. Um, uh, so they 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 took what uh, you know what they thought was the most commercial spin on the concept. Um, and then they, they peopled it with modern takes on the, the, um, uh, the, the world, you know, sort of looting the, the, the comics for their, for their texture. And I think it's worked really, really well. Um, uh, there are some, uh, you know, some movies that work, you know, that I think, yeah, I thought the Daredevil movie was lousy. 
never saw the Electra movie, never saw the Punisher movies, um, haven't seen the Ghost Rider movies, but, uh, but you know, the Avengers connected movies, I think, the, you know, they've, they've done a wonderful job with those. Um, uh, I think the DC movies have been extremely popular, but maybe a little colder. Um, uh, and and uh, but it's it's interesting seeing them, and it's a thrill sometimes when I get to sit there in in the audience, and I've got my daughter, you know, daughter on either side of me, and, and I'm going, see that, see that, Stark Tower, yeah, I made that up, <laughs> <laughs> made that up, that's mine. See when he jumps off the tower and he calls the armor to him and his pot, pot made that up, that's <laughs> mine, um, and uh, so so that's that's always fun. Of course, my daughters are much less interested in. See, when he uses the ID bracelet and the watch, Lynn Wien made that up. And they go, yeah, I think I've met Lynn. <laughs> but I still tell him anyway because that's who I am. <laughs> you got you to put that knowledge towards something, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. <coughs> yeah, I think we're getting to the home stretch here. But um, I think, yeah, we should talk about Astro City for a little bit because that's interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. No one ever comes <laughs> No one ever comes to these to hear about Astro City. Um, well, like it just came back as a Vertigo title, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it has had a sort of long and storied history, as, as much as I know, and a lot of sort of iterations and sort of stopping and starting. And so, I'm just sort of interested in a sort of oral history or a chronology of how it came about and what sort of happened along the way. Well, um, it came about in part because we. Um, I was asked if I wanted to do Marvels as an ongoing monthly series. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about ways to do it and stories that could be told. And I realized very early on that this would be very, very difficult because I would be coordinating every month with a different set of editors. Mm. You know, one of the things that we did in Marvels was we'd say, uh, okay, if we're telling a story about the Fantastic Four wedding, what else was going on in the Marvel Universe at the time? So, so if I'm telling a story about when the X-Men died in Dallas, what else was going on in the Marvel Universe at the time? It would be a lot of research to, to put all that together, and then the story has to be cleared by the X-Men editor, the Fantastic Four editor, the Spider-Man editor, the Hulk editor, you know, whoever I'm using. Um, and it would be a very, very labor-intensive, research-intensive, and, and editor-intensive process. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which I was discovering, I mean, when we did Marvels, in Marvels number one, the reason why J. Jonah Jameson is, is never named in that issue uh, is because uh, as we were about to go to press, the Spider-Man editor said, wait a minute, J. Jonah Jameson's not that old. Mm. I said, what do you mean? I mean, he's, he's, he'd have to be 68 years old for this story to be possible. Yeah, he's in his 40s. But there was a Spider-Man story back in the 70s or 80s when they tried to make him retire because he was older than mandatory retirement age. That means he's older than 65. No, he's in his 40s. He doesn't look like he's in his 40s. He doesn't <laughs> act like he's in his 40s. We've seen <laughs> stories of his youth in the 1920s. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, Marvel time rolls up behind itself. I said, yeah, that's why he can't be reporting on Al Capone. But it hasn't rolled up to the point that he couldn't be reporting on World War II. No, no, you have to change it to somebody else. So I said, well, okay, we can't change the art, but we can take his name out of it. And the issue came out and the Spider-Man editor was annoyed with us because it's clearly J. Jonah Jameson. I said, you can say it's his uncle. You can say it's his dad. You know, it's a guy who looks vaguely like Jonah who wants to, to uh, run the bugle someday. Um, you know, I told you to change it. You know, oh, no, we weren't going to paint a big mustache on him. The art was already done. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I decided I'll create my own world. I'll take all of the uh, character ideas I've had over the years that for one reason or another I haven't introduced anywhere. I'll take these story ideas that I, I uh, don't have a place for, you know, that, that, and I'll... I'll, I'll translate it all into a new world. Um, and, and I pitched that around to publishers and what with one thing and another, the best deal we got was at Image. Um, we did the first six issues at Image. Um, I ran through all my startup money and, uh, 
we hadn't gotten, you know, we, 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 we hadn't gotten much back in the way of profit yet. Um, and we were going to be late with issue seven, so we put it on hiatus. And as soon as we put it on hiatus, we started getting calls from Marvel, from DC, from, uh, uh, I guess it was Defiant then, that Jim Shooter's company then, from Milestone, from, from you know, lots of different publishers that want to be publishing a dark horse on it. Uh, and so we talked with a bunch of different publishers, and in the end, Jim Lee said, you know, just come over and do it. It'll still be through Image, but we'll do it with Wildstorm, and, you know, we'll pay you, and we'll do the production and so forth. Um, so that was when we went to, to his new imprint, Homage, um, and then uh, uh, DC bought Wildstorm. Mm -hmm. So then we're, we're still publishing through Wildstorm. It was, uh, uh, DC was the company behind it. Um, and then when they closed down Wildstorm, uh, that coincided with me being sick, so I wasn't able to, to write it for a few years. Um, and when we brought it back, the decision was made to bring it back at Vertigo because there was no Wildstorm imprint left, but Vertigo was where it, where it seemed to fit. What are the current plans for this new Vertigo iteration? More stories. <laughs> I mean, I heard there's like a villain and he's doing some bad stuff. And yeah, then he and he some, fights the heroes yeah. and they can't <laughs> stop. Um, we've had four issues out so far and uh, uh, all, all four of those issues were written back before it was a Vertigo book, so mm -hmm. there was no, you know, I, I knew that when the first issue came out, people were going to see the broken man and go, look, they've done this because it's a Vertigo book. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, in fact, we advertised the broken man in the last issue that was published from Wildstorm. Um, so this is, you know, issue five is actually the first issue that was written after the Vertigo decision. Mm. And then issues uh, six through 10 were all written before that. Um, uh, and, and uh, but anyway, um, issue, issue five looks back at Astro City's past in a, in a number of, of vignettes involving the broken man and his secrets. Um, issue six, we come back to uh, a story involving the, the, the ambassador and what he's doing on Earth in at least a tangential way. Um, issues seven through 10 are a four-part story involving Winged Victory and her origin and her mission, also featuring the new confessor and Samaritan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, uh, in issue 11 or possibly 12, depending on what order we put them out in, uh, we'll meet a new uh, character called the Silver Adept who is uh, a mystic hero, but nonetheless, she's kind of occupying the symbolic place in Astro City that the Silver Agent used to, because gotta be somebody silver in town. <laughs> um, and and we'll, we'll roll on from there. I've got years and years of stories I wanna tell, and it's just a question of, of what order we tell them in. Great, so I think we're pretty much out of time. So uh, thank you so much Let's for take this. one more thank question. Oh, you want to do one more question? One more question just because Great. I want to interrupt the applause. You, <laughs> sir. What do we just have to do to get an absolute Astro City or deluxe edition of the Astro That's a great question. Um, uh, basically, you would have to convince uh, DC that uh, there would be a big enough audience for it, which I wouldn't think would be all that hard. But um, uh, right now, the wrinkle is that just before we kind of went off the map, we started a new hardcover, you know, we brought out Life in the Big City in a new hardcover design. And we've got family album ready to go in that new hardcover design. And when we do the first hardcover from the new series, it'll be in that new design. So the idea is to reprint all the old hardcovers in the new design. And once those are all done and out, that would be the time that DC might be open to a, a uh, doing omnibuses or absolutes or, or so forth. Um, uh, but, uh, but that's a publishing decision, so, so that's their decision, not mine. And that, on that downer note, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thanks so much, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. You don't have to applaud. You weren't here. I wasn't here. No, not you, her. <laughs>